Praise God. So, yeah, the Lord put a put a word on my heart. Uh, and this is this is the title of this morning's message. You can trust the Lord. His word never changes. Amen. 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 You can trust the Lord. His word never changes. Can you turn with me to Proverbs? We're going to uh, read a couple of scriptures real quick. Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Now look with me to at Isaiah chapter 26 verses 3 and 4. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Trust, to have confidence, to be secure. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to your prayer this morning once again. And I ask, Lord, that your word would flow like a river, Lord, a river of anointing, Lord God, that it would flow out of me, just a simple vessel, Lord, that you've called to speak your word. Lord, you, you, you have chosen to use marred clay, Lord God, men. With mouths to speak forth your word. It confounds the wise, Lord. You've chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. I know that you've given me a good word this morning. But Lord, I pray that you'd give me the grace and the the, the, the strength that I would need in order to properly deliver this word, Lord God. I pray that your word would go forth, Lord. And with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That it would reach deep inside people's hearts and lives. Because Lord, as your people, I know good and well that every single person in this place this morning needs to hear this word, Lord because it will speak to their lives because it's real to each and every one of us. We just give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. So this message that the Lord put on our heart is that we can trust in his word. Amen? Amen. The thought of trust has confidence and security connected to it. And in this word, it has relevance to each and every aspect of our Christian lives. When we're not married and want to be, we will have to trust that God will bring the right one to us. Once we're married and hard times come, and they will, we will have to trust that God will give us strength to continue in his will. Trust is required in our finances. Trust is required in the raising of our children. Trust is required in our future. And when it comes to trusting God, there will have to be great patience involved. I can't really express that enough to say it again because I think the majority of this message describes that thought. Great patience must be involved when we learn to trust the Lord. Because it is unlikely that He will just immediately drop into our laps His ultimate will for our lives. Right, right. As a matter of fact, instead, people don't like this. Sometimes this messes with people's theology. But I'm here to tell you, instead, He will test us. Yeah. He will allow circumstances to take place in our lives and these circumstances have the tendency many times to produce uncertainty and restlessness in our lives. These emotions try to drive us to move outside of trusting him for his perfect will and instead in our impatience move towards our own will. This is an inevitable part of the Christian journey because in our first birth we are restless. In our first birth in Adam we want to control our own destiny. And our flesh resists God's will at the first because we cannot properly see the will of God for ourselves. Because we are too busy focusing on our own will for our own lives. Decisions made outside of God's will will only tend to open up more doors of frustration. In turn, causing us to question even more what God wants from us. Many times when we make these mistakes, the results can be so overwhelming that we become extremely frustrated and begin having thoughts and desires of quitting and running away from the situation. I don't like where I am. I don't like the pressure of this situation. Many times, even like in churches, a lot of times whenever the truth of God's word goes forth, people don't like the pressure and the feeling of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And they get that confused with being judged. 
No, there's nobody judging. Only the Holy Spirit can judge the fruit in a person's life. But when the truth of God's word goes forth, it will bring conviction to each and every person's heart. And it can, that in and of itself can cause uneasiness. And the next thing you know, we don't feel comfortable where we are because we don't really want to submit to God's will. So what we do is we run out the door. We go find us another place to go to church. And I'm not saying that that's for you specifically. But I'm just saying, we go find us another place to go to church. Why? Because we love God in our hearts and we still don't want to be in church. We just don't want to feel uncomfortable while we're serving God. And so we find another church with another preacher that'll tell us the words that we want to hear. And that's why the word of God says in the last days, they will heap to themselves piles of preachers because having itching ears. Yeah. In other words, in the Greek, a desire to hear pleasant words. They will resist the truth. Let us not be a people that resist the truth, Lord. Amen. Thoughts and desires <clears throat> like these are common to all of us. We have all experienced frustrations on the job and thought to ourselves, I would be better off if I left this job and went over here only to find that when I get over there, I'll realize that the people and the boss that I had before were actually more kind <laughs> and right. better than right. the new place yeah. that I am now. Yeah. How frustrating is that situation? People think it in marriage all the time. I would be better off leaving this one and grabbing this one only to realize afterwards that the frustrations of life are still present in the new house and marriage and a change of address didn't change anything spiritually. How many times have I personally thought, I bet I could start my own business and do a lot better than this? Maybe, but maybe not. I mean, I tried once before. Ignorance of how to pay taxes, and overhead coupled with the unwillingness of the majority of people to work as hard for me as I'm willing to work for my own boss left me frustrated and disillusioned with owning my own business. And then all I wanted was to get out. I want out, Lord. And I thank God that he actually opened the door and he got me out. The foundation of our trust in God is built upon his word. It is his word and not our feelings that are to be the compass of our journey. It is his will and not our own that is to be the path that we travel. In order to know his will, we must know his word. And without his word, we will be like a rudderless ship tossed on a tempestuous sea, disoriented as we move from port to port. Let me just hold on to this little analogy for a little longer and never really reaching the, his intended destination for our life. And finally, like a sailor plagued with scurvy and out of his mind, we abandon the ship altogether. Yeah. Right. Lord help us. Yeah. And that is the opposite result of trusting. It's called quitting. Mm. If trust gives us confidence and security and boldness to hold on and believe God in spite of what we see around us, then the opposite is that we become uncertain, nervous, and we make a decision to leave that place, mm. take matters into our own hands, and ultimately create for ourselves a new destiny, which will carry along with it its own sets of frustrations and uncertainties. Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6 again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. That word way is, it means road, it means distance, it means direction, it means the journey. So oftentimes our journey on Christianity is paralleled really with the story of the Bible and how we're walking through right. in our Christian experience upon this earth. You know, one of the things, and, I, and I'm not, please don't take this the wrong way. It, look, dude, live in Facebook. I don't care. I got off Facebook because I acted like a fool on Facebook. Because whenever people would say stuff that wasn't right scripturally, I felt like I had to correct the whole world. And I remember I corrected the guy. I did it. I, it was wrong with what I did. I'm just going to tell you what I did. Because <laughs> that was kind of like a, can I, am I permitted to use the word weenie? It was kind of like a weenie way for me to do it. And I should have done it. I mean, I missed my opportunity. I'm talking about like a, like a little bit of a sissy way. I missed my way of doing it. I was in the church at the old church that I was in. I was in, on the elder board. And the main grand poobah of the Assemblies of God of the state of Louisiana came to our church. And he was preaching. And he said from the pulpit, and I mean, I'm not trying to pick on anybody that's done this too. But he said from the word, from the pulpit, the word crap. 
And then he said, am I allowed to say that? And everything in me wanted to rise up and say, no, sir, you're not. You're not allowed to say that, but I didn't. And what I did was I went home and I did it on Facebook. I said, I said, he did it in public. Now, I thought in my mind that I had scriptural precedence to do that because Paul corrected uh, Barnabas in public whenever Barnabas played the hypocrite. Nevertheless, I'm just telling you, I'm being transparent. The Lord convicted me of that. And he said, you got a big mouth and you need to get off Facebook. I'm not talking about you. Why did I even do that? Because I remember one time I was talking to Robert about Facebook and I said, you know, though, I really do believe <laughs> that we can handle Facebook like we're supposed to handle the world. It's not for me, but I'm just saying. Because the reason why is because Facebook is really just a digital version of the world. In other words, what I'm saying is. We have to traverse the pathway of life. We have to go on the journey. And if we can walk as Christians in the real world, certainly we can act like Christians Amen. on Facebook. Amen. Amen. Amen? I just use that as an illustration to try to make the point that we have to travel the journey. And the Word of God says to trust the Lord with all your heart and to lean not on your own understanding. And if you would acknowledge Him, then He would direct your path. He's going to direct your journey, right? And He also said again in Isaiah, remember, that He will keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon Him, because He trusts in the Lord. And trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord in the Lord is everlasting strength. Amen? One of the ways that we will know that we are in his will along the way of the journey is through the presence of peace. Mm -hmm. I can't really like emphasize that enough. Amen. The presence of peace. I've shared this story before, but I'll share it again because it's the first time that it really happened to me that I knew that the Lord was trying to speak to me, but I still miss God. And now if it ha and it doesn't happen all the time this way, I'm telling you, it's not always this palpable. But sometimes, like I remember Danielle and I, we were buying into a timeshare and the guy was sitting there talking to me and I'm telling you all of a sudden out of my heart, I mean, in my heart, I felt this presence of a lack of peace. My heart, physiologically, things started to change. My heart started beat, beating fast. I don't get anxiety. I just don't. I mean, I'm not saying I've never been anxious. I'm a human being. But what I'm saying is I don't get panic attacks. But all of a sudden, my heart started beating fast. And I went ahead like a little dog with his tail between his legs. And I signed that piece of paper. And I realized later. And listen, I'm not coming against you if you've got a time share. I'm just telling you that the Lord tried to warn me against that. And there, there's been other times that I, I felt uncomfortable. There's a lack of peace because the Lord is trying to reveal to me his will for my life. And he's trying to tell me, don't go down this pathway. Instead, go another way. So peace is a barometer for God's will. When you have a lack of peace, God is sending you a message of some sort that something is wrong. And when there is peace, God is sending you a message that something is right. Well, what is it, preacher? Why don't I have peace? What is God trying to tell me? I don't know the specifics of what God is trying to tell you about the destination of your journey. Also, like you, I have to seek his will. Amen? I have to read the word. See, sometimes people want a preacher that's just going to give them all the answers. You came to the wrong destination, my friend. Because that's not even the will of God. It's not even the will of God that another man Amen. tell you the will of God for your life. And any preacher that tries to tell you that it is is a liar and he's got a control spirit. And Jesus said, of, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It means Nico control, the laity, the people. Jesus hates control of the people. And in reality, what the Lord has revealed to me about his word is that the job of the pastor is to teach the people how to connect properly with the Lord, to access Jesus and the presence of God through faith in Christ and what Christ has done, which releases a flow of the Holy Ghost in your life that will allow you to hear the voice of God for yourself. Amen. And along the way, guess what happens? Sometimes we make mistakes. Right. Oh, he's a preacher that says it's okay to fall in sin. No, I'm not. But we're all human beings and we're all going to make our own mistakes and we're all going to fall flat on our face. And if you don't like that message and you came up under the word of faith doctrine, and that was a lie also. Yeah. I'm here to tell you right now that this, this is a real world and the spirit of Antichrist is still has power on this earth and mankind still has a sinful nature and his flesh wants what
what he wants, and he goes the wrong way so many times, but God doesn't waste anything. He'll pick you back up because a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. Christianity is a getting up kind of thing. Amen? You get up and you put your eyes, hallelujah, back on Jesus, and you keep on walking and you keep on running. I'm telling you, man, there's got to be endurance in this race. This is not a 5K. Amen. This is a marathon. Right, right. Let me tell you something. If you never ran a marathon, about mile 16, it starts to hurt real bad. And let me tell you, it'll start getting in your mind that, oh, no, I'd just be better off quitting it. I see that little dude driving in that car right there. I think I'm about to hop in there with him and let him take me back to the finish line. <laughs> but you can't quit. Right, right. Amen. So I have to seek his face. Just like you do. I have to pray and I have to study his word. And I have to know his word. Amen. Because I don't want to go the wrong way. Lord knows I've done it. I don't want to keep going the wrong way time and again, time and again. And lack of peace and only chaos and frustration. So we so often want what we want now and expect to get all our answers immediately. The kind of Christianity that I was saved into was very event oriented. Let me just try to explain to you what I'm talking about. Now, listen, Christianity is full of events. I'm not trying to take away from the event. When you get saved, that is a major event. You know, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, that is a major event. But let me tell you something. Christianity is not just about event to event to event. Christianity is also a process. Mm -hmm. There's a great process that is involved in the journey of Christianity. And I'm just telling you that the kind of churches that I went to for many years were very event driven and event oriented. In other words, you had a problem, and so what you did, and I always talk like this, and don't, don't take it too literal, because I believe in people coming to the front, and I believe in us laying hands on people, and I do believe that sometimes the Holy Spirit will slain people in the Spirit, and I do, I believe that, that, I believe in that He's a God of the suddenly, and I believe that He does a work right now, and I believe that He shows up in the midnight hour, and I believe that, I believe that He did it for me, I've told you the story, how after 12 years of mediocre Christianity at best. I was in a bar room. I hadn't been in a bar room in 12 years. I was drunk. I was messed up. My sister had taken her life and all. And I'm telling you, God showed up. I had a great event that night. Yeah. But that, but that, but God showing up that night and causing that event and revealed to me. This is one of the things He said: "You will present My word for the way that it's written, and then I will use you." I didn't even know what that meant. I had to learn what is the word of God even saying. Mm -hmm. How do I present his word for the way that it's written? And listen, I'm still a man. I'm still on the journey of learning what his word it says. Mm -hmm. But I tell you one thing. I'm a man that has a whole different revelation and understanding of his word than I did back then. Mm -hmm. Because most of the people that were preaching to me didn't know the word. I'm not picking on them. I'm just telling you, they didn't do their study. They learned from their fathers before them, from their fathers before them. And it was just a regurgitation of information that had come down the pipe. No, the tradition of men. You were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold that you learned from the vain tradition of your fathers, but by the precious blood of a lamb, which was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. Listen to me. The word of God is saying something. And in the word of God, there's a process involved and there's endurance involved and there's struggles involved and there's frustrations involved. But you hold on to Jesus. Amen. And you keep on going. Hallelujah. Because what? Well, that's not the scripture. I'm not going to say that. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's not that. Yeah, but it's true, though. You know, there's something to persevere spiritually. Amen? Right, right. So I'm very event oriented, you know? It's like, okay. And that's what was preached every time, you know? It's like, you got this in your life, and you need God to touch you. Yes, I do. I need God to touch me. And it's like, come up here and let the man of God lay his hands on you. And Lord, he lays his hands on you. And, you know, Half the time, I was never different when I left. I just wasn't because I didn't know where to put my faith. Yeah. Right. Without realizing it, I was. I was putting my faith in walking up to the altar. And I was putting my faith in the man of God. It's going to get better when the man of God touches me. And then next week, I was doing it again. And the next week again because I was never really being set free. But the word of God speaks of liberty. And it speaks of freedom. And Jesus has already done it. When he hung naked on the cross, he said, it is finished because he completed the work and not only did he complete a work so that you could be saved and spend eternity with him he completed a work to release the grace of the holy spirit in your life so you can walk in victory today praise god victory today amen i said victory today 
That's right. And we can walk in it, but we're going to have to choose mm -hmm. to believe him at his word. And we're going to have to choose to be willing to walk in the victory that Jesus paid such a high price for us to have. Amen. So we were just event, man, from event to event. And we were never really learning the patience or perseverance or steadfastness. No, the thought of trust requires holding on to God in the very middle yes. of untoward circumstances and trusting him to get us through. And the lies I, I'm picking on today of the word of faith said that if you're going through it, then you didn't have enough faith mm -hmm. and you needed to confess yourself out of that because there's no way that was God's will for your life. Mm -hmm. You know, what a damage to the people of yeah. God that yeah. lying yeah. doctrine yeah. spread yeah. across this globe. When it said that if you're going through things, then you must not have enough faith. How dare that? Oh, man, I get so angry sometimes. How dare that lying preacher? You know what he was? He was a vessel for the enemy that started all that. And they all bought in. And now it's just a big money, grubbing, greedy, uh, all for gain ministries all over the place. Give us money and you're going to plant your seed of faith. And now you're going to receive your harvest. Listen, I believe in seed and sowing and, and receiving a harvest. The word of God speaks of seed and sowing and harvest all over the place. But the way that it's pronounced and the way that it's proposed is not the will of God. Amen. You got to go through some things sometimes. You know, I, okay, so I guess if that'd be the case that it wasn't God's will for Paul to be imprisoned or decapitated right, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or it wasn't God's will that Mark be drugged behind a chariot through the streets of Egypt until he died. Listen, thank God you probably won't have to get dragged behind a chariot. Thank God I probably won't have to get my cut off my head cut off for Jesus in America today. But we never know what's going to happen before Jesus. Matter of fact, that's another word. Let me just tell you this. Don't just sit here and think you're going to sit back comfortably in your American, on your American couch watching your American television. And don't think that trial and tribulation cannot hit this country just because you think you're an American. Jesus wasn't an American. I thank God for this country. I've been to Mexico. I've seen those poor people, uh, family riding on one moped. I've been to Venezuela when I was in the oil field and driving up in the mountains and seeing these people living in shacks. I thank God that I'm an American. I thank God my daddy taught me to be patriotic and to love this country. I thank God for the opportunities that have been uh, afforded me to be an American yes. citizen. Listen, Paul was a Roman citizen and it afforded him certain opportunities. I didn't have to be born in America, but let me tell you something, Jesus wasn't an American. This world isn't all about America. We have an egocentric, you know, ego means self, centric means centered. We are very self-centered in this country. And we think the whole world evolves around us, just like we oftentimes in our own lives think that our whole world revolves around us. Lord, help us. Yeah, Lord. Because sometimes we may have to go through some things. I mean, was that not the, the will of God? Right. Amen. That when, right. when Paul got his head cut off for the gospel, it was either that or recant his statement. Yeah. All they had, all them fellas had to do was change their story. Do right. you realize that? <laughs> you just change your story. It all goes away. Thank wow. you, Lord, for you. You see, and that's what the enemy's trying to do in your individual lives. He's trying to just get you to change your story. Right. And to back right. off and go back. Come on. No, sometimes bad things do happen to believers on this earth because this earth has fallen and the spirit of Antichrist still has power today. And everywhere you turn, there will be an opportunity to chart your own course and walk outside of God's will as you walk towards your own. Right. Amen. That brings me to the Bible story I want to share with you this morning. I want to talk to you about this. It comes from the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth took place during the time of the judges. This time frame was landmarked by this statement. You ready? There was no king and the people did what was right in their own eyes. For you and I today, that means that even though we are saved and are the people of God, at certain moments of our lives, we aren't allowing Jesus to have his proper place. Instead of allowing him to be the king of our heart, we assume the throne and tell him to take a seat on the side. Come on. That was the social context of the book of Judges. And the geographical location of this story was a small little town in Judah named Bethlehem. Now, in this church, how many times have you been told what Bethlehem means? Hmm. Go ahead, say it. Right. You can, no, say it out loud. Go ahead, go ahead, say it. 
It gets it, you know what it means, right? What house of bread, right? I know I heard y'all. I can see y'all, even the ones that didn't want to say it. We're smiling. I know that. But how many times, for how long have we been knowing that Bethlehem means house of bread, yet at the same time, you and I have charted our own destination outside and left Bethlehem, left the house of bread, even in all our knowing and all our wisdom and all our knowledge. Because let me tell you something. I know that the preacher has done it himself. Lord, help us. Matthew chapter, and what is, what, is that, what is bread a type of according to the scripture? The Amen, I believe it's a type of the word of God. It's a type of Jesus, and the word of God tells us of Jesus. Matthew 4.4, 4, when the Lord was combating the enemy, what did he say? He answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Praise the word of God is the bread of God. The bread of God is Jesus. The word of God reveals Jesus. If you know the word, you know Jesus. Amen. And that's how you're going to chart your destination. Yet in all our knowing and wisdom and intelligence, there have been times that we have walked away. All of us. Yes. We find ourselves in the midst of this tempestuous storm, wondering how in the world did we get right here? Now I'm just going to say, you did it. I did it. Right. We charted our own course and we went our own way. Right. I'm, done, I'm not going to apologize this morning for speaking the truth of God's word. Amen. I'm done apologizing. Let's speak the truth. We still need preachers to stand behind the pulpit and just to tell the truth. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. The time was when there was no king. The place was Bethlehem. And the condition was that there was a famine in the land. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when you're starving, you will settle on anything. Yeah. I know that if I would just wait just a little bit longer, I could access a prime cut of ribeye. <laughs> There's nothing like a prime cut of ribeye if you like steak. Mm -hmm. But here's a Waffle House right here. <laughs> and I'm hungry. So I will settle for this piece of meat. That was the conditions in the book of Ruth. People were hungry. Hunger was gnawing at their belly and making them desperate. And they wanted an answer to the problem. So the Bible gives us a snapshot of what one man and his family and his response to the problems of the day. His name was Elimelech. He took Naomi, his wife, and his two boys, Mylon and Chilion, and he left the house of bread and he went to a worldly place known as Moab. He left the word of the Lord and he charted his own journey. Like Lot towards Sodom or Jacob deceiving Isaac with a first, sleeve, a first sleeve. Like Moses killing an Egyptian and burying him in the sand. Or David getting Uriah drunk and sending him home to be with Bathsheba. Or even worse, writing a letter to the general and having Uriah killed. Like all these countless great men of God, Elimelech left the will of God and charted his own course. The story of Ruth in so many ways is one of the most powerful allegories <laughs> written by the Holy Spirit about the plan of God. An absolute masterpiece. I'm telling you, when you read the word of Ruth through the eyes and the Holy Spirit opens it up, you see a masterpiece of the foreshadowing of the plan of God. Where Ruth, as a Gentile bride, is married to Boaz, who in the English translation is called the kinsman Redeemer. You can't get a better story than that. Do you understand that you are a Gentile bride? Do you understand that Jesus is the kinsman redeemer? The Bible teaches that he became flesh and blood so that he could pour out his blood to redeem fallen mankind. What a beautiful, beautiful story. He was our kinsman. He became flesh so that he could die for us. This whole pic book is a picture of salvation. You and I are rude. Jesus died for us so we could be his bride. And without that, there is no access to grace. And without that, there is no access to bread. And without bread, there is no compass. There's no word to trust. And with all that said, that's what I'm talking to you about this morning. Trust. And when we leave it, the repercussions that follow. The story of Ruth takes a tragic turn whenever Elimelech dies. <coughs> His two boys had married two Moabite girls and not and then and and they were and then they died also. And for the next 10 years, his wife Naomi is left to wander lost in the world of Moab like a ship without a rudder. But then one day she was reminded of the bread of God. Amen. Amen. 
Look at Ruth chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. I want you to see what happened to Naomi after she's been wandering in the world for 10 years. You ever wandered in the world? You were a Christian. You were called by God. You knew the truth. But you found yourself wandering aimlessly in the world. And then one day, the Lord reminded you of his goodness. Hallelujah. And he told you, you need to get back to the house of bread. Amen. Amen. It said, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. That brings me to point number one. You ready? Our trust has to be in what God says. What God says never changes. I want to repeat that again. Our trust has to be in what God says because what God says never changes. Hebrews 13, 8 and 9. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. You know what the, ex the, the essence of this scripture is? That God's word doesn't change. That God doesn't change. Faith in Jesus doesn't change. The teachings of the Lord don't change. These Hebrew people that were, this was written to, I don't, I'm not going to get too deep on this. But you know what? They were being tested and tempted to change the object of their faith and to look again towards animal sacrifice. But that's not the will of God anymore. Mm. We're always being tempted to look somewhere else. Yeah. See, when you find yourself frustrated and uncertain whether you were in the will of God, make sure you didn't leave Bethlehem hmm. and venture outside of his word. God doesn't change his mind. Numbers 23 and 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and shall he not do? Or has he spoken and shall he not make it good? He's not a man that he's going to lie. Listen to me, child of God. You might change your mind, but God will never change his mind. His word is set. His word is what you must learn to trust. His word is a rock. It is a firm foundation. You can build your life on his word. And when we don't, look at Galatians 6, 7 and 8. It says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Thank you, Lord, for your word that reminds us. You know, the good news is that we don't have to die outside of Bethlehem. I know sometimes we do. Sometimes people do. But we don't have to. We can venture back to the house of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Point two. Listen to this. This is a good point. You ready? You won't be happy when you stop trusting God and start baking your own bread. Look at Ruth chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. See, when she got back over there to Bethlehem, everybody's like, oh, look, Naomi's back. She said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? See, the name Naomi means my delight. Delight means that you have great pleasure in something. You know, God's word for Naomi's life and God's word for your life is that he wants you. He has a plan for us. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Other translations said a future and a hope. God has a plan for our lives that will bring joy and happiness and pleasure. But when we venture outside of trusting his word and his plan for our lives, it's not that he changes our course. It's not that he changes our name. No, we're the ones that did all that. Right, right. Mara, it means bitter. It comes from the Old Testament in Exodus, the bitter waters of Mara. You remember that story when the children of Israel on their first journey, they got thirsty and they went to go drink the water? Bitter. The waters were poisonous. 
Thank God he's got a plan, though. Even back then, what he did do, he threw, told him to throw some wood in the water, wow. a type of the cross. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Putting your faith in Jesus, keeping your faith there in the grace that flows will turn the most bitter of situations oh, into Hallelujah. sweet, sweet water. Amen. Jesus, right. you, Jesus is the sweetener of all. We don't need stevia. Lord, stay away from sweet and low, whatever you do. But you, got, you need to put Jesus in your drink. Amen. Oh, yes. Praise God. If you go back and you look again at Ruth chapter 1 verse 21, she blames everything on God. She remembers a time where she felt full. I thought that was interesting because remember there was a famine in the land, but she says, she said, look at this. He, I went out full. Even though there was a famine, wow. when she looks back on it, she's like, I was really full. Wow. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? The word testify means just to speak against. Right? Well, yeah, he speaks against you. You walked away from his bread. You walked away from his word. Every time you walk away from the word of God, peace will give way to chaos and delight will give way to bitterness. It was never God's will that they would walk away. Bethlehem never changed locations. Amen? Bethlehem was always there the whole time. Praise God. Okay, this brings me to point number three. The blessing doesn't come when you want it. It comes when he releases it. When Naomi came back, listen to this, man. This was so good, man. I felt like the Lord was reminded. And look, this is, I can only preach it because I've lived it. All right? It says... She still had to face all the stressors that were there when she left. Yep. Sometimes we think we're going to escape these things. We're going to run away, stay gone for a little while, hmm. sneaky peeky, come on back, and everything's going to be hunky dory, copacetic, everything's fine. No, it's not that way. They, like, we act like God ain't over there watching and know, doesn't know every minute detail of our heart. He knew what we were struggling with when we left. And he's like, you think you come back over here and you ain't going to deal with it again? No, that's not how we work in this right. kingdom. Because right. you're going to still have to deal with it. Yeah. All the stressors that were there when you left are going to be waiting for you when you come back. Uh, he will guarantee that they're still there. Because he is so much more worried about the change that needs to take place in your heart uh, than he is about giving you the blessing that you're looking to receive from him. Oh, he's got a blessing for you, bud. He's got a plan for your life. Amen. But he's more concerned about you submitting to his will and allowing the Holy Spirit to conform you into the image of his dear son. He wants you to look beautiful like Jesus. Amen. So when Naomi came back, all those stressors were still there. There was still a money crisis. The loss, loss of the farm was imminent. She had left, but now she's back and the cycle starts all over again. She still has to trust God to provide for them daily what they need. So when we choose to escape instead of trusting after the high is over, I hope you I hope it's okay if you if I talk like this. After the high is over, okay? Whether listen, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of stuff. I do it all the time, but we want to make it real. The drugs, the alcohol, new relationships, new cars, new houses, new clothes. Whatever the serotonin bump is. You understand that? Like when you do something new, and it's exciting. You know what happens is, is that your synapses in your brain are flooded with serotonin. It's like, oh, such a feeling of well-being. This feels so good. But guess what? The high is going to come down. Man. Preach it. Mary, the honeymoon don't last forever. Preach it. Reality slaps you in the face. Mm -hmm. All these things can put butterflies to flight in our tummies. All these things can be tantalizing to our flesh. But then serotonin comes back to normal and we have to live in reality. And we will be right back where we were when we left and have to start trusting him all over again. And he will make sure that the situation remains where you will have to depend on him. Yes. You see, even though there was no longer a famine in the land, Naomi and Ruth were alone. They were facing foreclosure on the farm. Elimelech and the boys were dead, so there was no one to plow or plant. They still had to trust God to give them bread, even though the famine was over in the house of bread. So the blessing is going to come, not when you want it, but when he releases it. Look at Ruth chapter 2, verse 3. 
And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hat, I'll, I can't never forget the first time I taught the book of Ruth, Ruth I was like, look at that word right there, her hat. It's, it's, it's an old English version of happenstance, right? Her happenstance was to light upon part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now, I mean, do you really honestly believe that it was just an accident? <laughs> that... Out of all the fields in Bethlehem that she could have landed in, she happens to land in the field of Boaz, who happens to be the kinsman redeemer for that family. I don't have to get into all the law of Israel to really break down for you what a kinsman redeemer truly was. But there was only certain people that could redeem you when you were in a bind and bail you out of your situation. And that's why it required Jesus. Because let me tell you something, when God formed Adam out of the clay, this earth wasn't fallen. When he breathed life into Adam, there was no sin in Adam. But when, sin took, when Adam took sin into himself, the entirety of the human race became an infected with this thing called sin. That's why God had to become a man because God created man without sin. Therefore, man without sin had to die to pay the penalty for sin. So she happened, an unforeseen meeting. Sometimes it comes across as an accident, but I got to tell you something that when God was ready for them to get what he promised, he positioned them where he wanted them to be. Sometimes things seem accidental, but God moves pieces around to give us another chance. There will always be new opportunities to trust him. But if you think that that is going to be easy, no, the cycle starts all over again. There's an opportunity to trust or to quit. And while he will meet our daily needs, there will be plenty of frustrations along the way. As a matter of fact, if you think that we're going to bypass the lesson that God desires for us to learn just by running from it, then we're wrong. As a matter of fact, I used that a lot, didn't I? If we ran from it in the past, we can probably expect to be tested in it more vigorously in the future. Now, that's just, that's just life experience right there, bud. <laughs> if you were prone to quit in the past, you're likely going to have to face it again. You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday. Once you quit once, it just becomes easier to quit again. I was having a conversation when we were talking about, I, was, went back, I was doing jujitsu. I think I'm going to get back up in that, whether you like it or not. <laughs> if I get a black eye, you know what it's from. But whenever I was doing jujitsu, one of the things that they were teaching us, man, you better hurry up and tap. I can't remember one time, it was kind of funny. Dude weighed, couldn't weigh more than 140 pounds. He's a brown belt now. His name's Jesse Simino. I don't know if you know. Anyway. I was when I first started, man, he rolled me around, dude. He had my arm in an arm bar, and I can remember I didn't even know how to say tap. I was like a little girl. I said, ah! <laughs> and I said, is that okay? He's like, you got to say the word. <laughs> tap. But one of the things that I learned is, is that, yeah, it's good to tap so you don't really get hurt, but the more you tap, the more easy it becomes to tap in the future. That's right. I don't want to get hurt. Now, I won't get all messed up looking, but at the same time, I do want perseverance. I'm just trying to use that as an illustration. Sometimes whenever we quit, it becomes easier to quit again. And if you've quit in the past, I guarantee you're going to have to be face. You're going to have to face it again. And the Lord's constantly giving you new opportunities to trust in him and to walk with him. And he's giving you another opportunity to hold on and not to quit. Amen. Amen. He will meet our daily needs along the way because he loves us and he provides for us. But when our heart is hungry for what we want, what he's offering never feels like enough. Ultimately, he's more worried again about the change in us than he is about giving us the desires of our heart. We're over here saying, oh, God, this is what I need from you. Why does it take so long to get there? He's saying, no, I will give you daily what you need. But what I need from you is that you let me change your heart. Hmm. Ruth chapter 2, verse 7. We're just going to read a couple of these verses and we're about to close. You ready? She said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. So this is, this is actually Boaz's uh, field foreman. Boaz walks up on the field and he sees who's that, little, who's that girl out there working so hard. His foreman says, oh, that's Ruth. That's the Moabite girl that came back with Naomi. She came over here and she asked if she could glean in the field. She's been out there all day long working in the hot sun. She took a little quick break for a second, but she was right back at it. She's been in the field all day long. Look at Ruth chapter 2, verse 12. 
This is Boaz now talking to her. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you are come to trust. You know, Ruth didn't know anything about the God of Israel. If you think about that, do you remember the time whenever you first got saved, how you probably didn't know anything about the ways of God? Sometimes if you're anything like me, I was in the faith for 12 years. And after 12 years, I still really didn't know a whole lot. Right. About the things of God. I have to encourage you though. If you hang around somewhere long enough. Where they're teaching the word of God. Before it's over with. You will have learned some things. And you will have learned of how to walk with the Lord. And what I'm here to say is this. Is that it requires time and patience. Ruth was in that field all day long. Boaz saw it. And just as you and I in the field of this world. Working for the Lord. Walking with the Lord. The Lord is watching and he sees it. Guess what he does? He rewards patience. He rewards he does reward hard work. And when I say hard work, I'm not just talking about reading your Bible to be saved. That's not good doctrine. I'm not talking about showing up at church just to be saved, although you should do all of those things. I'm talking about just every day. The word that I created a while back, stick to itiveness, not giving up, not quitting, endurance, patience, perseverance. Amen. Amen. Ruth chapter two, verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out that. She had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. It's about six gallons. That's a lot of grain. Mm -hmm. Amen. They probably carried it up and put it up in their dress, and she was walking home with all that grain. The Lord took care of her need that day. Right. Amen. I'm not. I don't have time to get into how the story ends. It's a really good story of how Boaz shows up and he marries her, and she's taken care of, and old Naomi's taken care of too. But, you know, I just want to end with this hard work and time. The journey will require patience because his will requires time and patience and time and patience are his. Does that make sense? He owns time. And you know what? He owns patience. If you thought you were born with that, no, you might have been born with some messed up DNA from Adam, but you were not born with patience. Patience is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Endurance in situations. Whenever I talk about patience, I always like to talk about long suffering because long suffering is patience in relationships. And most of the time, the patience in circumstances is always connected to patience in relationships. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't just throw you out the window whenever you didn't act right? Right. But so many times we're ready to quit on folk. Amen. Lord, help us because we need to learn the long suffering of Jesus. It's a fruit of the spirit. Amen. The main thing I always say about that is, is that, it, in other words, it's not a fruit of us. We need the Holy Spirit to produce that in our life. Yes. We're dependent on God to yeah. produce these things in our life. Amen. And I'm going to go bring it back to the message of the cross. Because you're not going to pray if your motives are wrong. We talked about this Wednesday night. Okay. When I, when I say you're not going to pray it into existence, what I'm trying to say is, is that if your motives are wrong and you're putting your faith in your prayer life. Do you understand how we can change the object of our faith? And we listen to, don't tell me it doesn't happen because it happens to people all the time. Yeah. You start doing good in your prayer life. You start getting up at five, four, maybe, and you're praying. And you know, one of the things that you'll realize is, is that you're probably the only old boy or girl doing that. <laughs> like they ain't a whole lot of people up in the church getting up at four o'clock in the morning and praying, right? So what the enemy does is he whispers in your ear. He says, look at you, how holy you are. Look at you, how righteous you are. Look at you, you seeketh the Lord. And no one else seeketh the Lord like you do. Right? And so you start thinking more highly of yourself than what you ought to. God is not, he is not in the pride. Listen to me. He's repelled by pride. Yeah, sure. God resists the pride. Amen. You know why? It looks like the devil. Mm -hmm. And whenever, it, it, what it means is when he resisteth the proud, it means he's, he, he sets himself. He's like ready for battle. The Lord's ready for battle because he recognizes something that don't look right. Yes. You're carrying around with you the spirit of something and it ain't the spirit of the Lord. So what I'm trying to say is let's pray. Let's seek the face of God. Let's get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Let's pray. Let's read the scriptures. Let's cry out to God. When you can't sleep instead of tossing and turning and all, get up. Seek God. Amen. I'm all about it. Let's go to church. The more people, the, the better it feels in church. Amen. But let us not change the optic of our faith from what he did to what we do. 
Right. And when we keep our object of our faith in Christ and what Christ has done, you know what that's all about? That's about access to grace. Yeah. See, when you got saved, guess what? God gave you the gift of Jesus' righteousness. I know we say this all the time, but you know what? Ain't hey, none of us have heard it enough. Because we keep on leaving Bethlehem. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Okay, it's a recurrent pattern. So we're just going to keep on saying it. Whenever you got saved, the exchange took place. The Holy, the Holy Spirit gave you the righteousness of Jesus. And Jesus took your guilt. Amen? And he made you righteous in the eyes of God. Not because you did all the right stuff but because Jesus did all the right stuff. And if you will keep your faith in Christ and what Christ did every single day, that's the prescription. That's right. If we had a prescription pad, that's what we would say. There's a disease. It's called sin. God wrote a prescription. Sig, that means the old Latin for directions. Take a dose of Jesus and what he did for you at the cross, Amen. Q day. Every day. You got to take it every day. Amen. You take your medicine every day. I'm going to eat Jesus. I'm going to eat his word. He is the bread of life. And when I do that, guess what? Now I'm being, I'm getting some nutrition. Oh, thank you, Lord. When I keep my faith in Christ and what Christ has done, now the Holy Spirit is being released in my life. Just like food, digesting and diffusing into the bloodstream and allowing it energy to be produced in the physical body, so it is with faith in Christ and what Christ has done. This ain't even in my notes, but this is good. Yeah. So it is with Christ and what Christ has done when I keep my faith in that. It's like I'm eating yeah. the bread of life, amen, and yeah. spiritually speaking, I'm receiving yeah. the power from the Holy Spirit yeah. to hold on, hallelujah, hold on one more day. One more trial. I know, oh boy, look, let me tell you something. The whole time I'm getting stronger. Yeah. I'm getting stronger, man. And I'm being built up in the power of God, amen, so that I can face the trials of life. Amen. And so that I can reveal Jesus to a lost and dying world through me. Amen. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but the Lord can get you through it. Amen.